So thank you everybody for joining us um, uh, for our fourth press conference of the EGU General Assembly uh, 2024. My name is Hazel Gibson. I'm the EGU's Head of Communications and I am delighted to welcome you to hear from our excellent speakers that we have joining us today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, if you are joining us online, uh, welcome. And uh, if you could please remember to mute your microphones, we will be going through the presentations from our speakers uh, together, and then we will take all questions and answers at the end of that time. At that point, you will be able to unmute your microphones and ask questions directly of our panelists, um, or you can write your questions into the chat and I will be able to ask them on your behalf. Obviously, we will be also be able to take questions from the room uh, if anyone wants to ask direct, direct questions there as well. So I would like now to uh, introduce our two speakers today for, um, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, press conference number four, which is titled By Jove, New Revelations About Jupiter's Planetary System. Our first speaker is uh, Krissa, oh, and I'm going to mess this up again. I'm so really sorry. Krissa Abdelidou. Krista Abdelidou, I am very sorry, everybody. Uh, Krista Abdelidou, who is from the School of Physics and Astronomy in the University of Leicester, United Kingdom, and Scott Bolton from the Southwest Research Institute at the United States of um, America. Uh, we will start first with Krista, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation, and thank you, everyone who is uh, here or connected to uh, to listen to our story. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, I work now at the University of uh, Leicester in the UK. However, this work uh, started uh, many, many years ago while I was still postdoc at the Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur in Nice in uh, France. That's why the double affiliation. And this work was done together with uh, uh, my good colleagues, uh, Marco Del Bo and Alessandro Morbidelli, also from Nice uh, in France. And of course, uh, with uh, our colleagues uh, from uh, Southwest Research, Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, David Nesvorny and Kevin Walsh. So um, I was very proud to be in this work with all these dynamics there, although I come from a different background on small bodies and uh, compositions and uh, impact studies. So I will try to keep this... Uh, I didn't do that. Okay, but I will try to keep this uh, presentation as uh, easy as uh, as uh, possible uh, by telling you a story because this work started really many years ago, since 2017, uh, and I will have the proper presentation later today uh, in the session of small bodies and dust um, this uh, afternoon, and we're expecting our paper to be out three minutes ago. So, um, okay. Let me start the story. This is uh, in the asteroid uh, belt, with, which is what you see here in this uh, plot. It is between the orbits of uh, Mars uh, and Jupiter. They reside uh, millions of, uh, of uh, asteroids, of small bodies, which they show diversity in their physical properties, their masses, um, their diameters, their spectral signature, which is a proxy, first proxy for, the, for the, um, their composition. And uh, in this specific plot, it's one of the dots is a different asteroid. And you can see here at the color map, we try uh, using their spectral data from ground-based uh, observations, but also from the Gaia mission of the European Space Agency. We paint them with different colors, de denoting more or less their composition, what we think they are. Um, and um, we can see also by eye, I hope it is uh, obvious that there are some higher concentrations of density of objects uh, in the main belt. And this, uh, we call them uh, asteroid families. So what are the asteroid families? In the main belt, during its lifetime, happen several collisions between uh, the small bodies and uh, the fragments, they, um, in, uh, they share uh, similar uh, uh, orbital um, uh, elements, uh, but also they can share similar composition if the body, of course, is homogeneous. That's why you can see them in these plots uh, nicely concentrated. So our team uh, discovered, uh, our team in Nice, uh, discovered uh, an asteroid uh, family in the inner part of the belt, is where you see the, the red uh, circle, um, which uh, was generated by an impact event about three uh, billion years uh, ago. Uh, for uh, This uh, result was published 2019. So for almost five years, since 2017, uh, I was doing ground-based, uh, observing it uh, 
uh, with ground-based telescope to obtain their spectra in order to understand what is the composition of this family and to uh, and then to connect it uh, to link it uh, if possible with meteorites um, this um, uh, family is called Athor. The name uh, was taken by the largest uh, fragment inside uh, the family, the largest asteroid member. Um, by comparing with uh, meteorite data, uh, we link it with a very rare type of meteorites, which is called ensatite chondrites. And uh, this is uh, an important um, uh, that was an important discovery because this source is the only one that we have found so far in the whole uh, asteroid belt. Uh, and uh, the ensatite meteorites are the ones that have the closest composition to to our planet. Um, uh, however, with this study, we found two little problems. By trying to put back all the material together and understand what was the initial size of the parent body that generated this family, we end up with a small uh, object in diameter. However, our colleagues that they used uh, ensatite chondrites, meteoritic data, uh, with their modeling, they, uh, they state that no, the parent body should be much uh, larger, a few hundreds of kilometers in diameter. So we have one issue here. And the second issue is that we know that this material, uh, this body should have accreted close uh, to the orbit uh, of, uh, of Earth, but why do we see it now in the belt? Our working hypothesis is that um, the parent body of uh, the ensatite meteorites who had formed close uh, to, to, to the orbit of, uh, of the Earth, then it should have suffered a, a fast collisional event in one of the fragments, which is the asteroid family progenitor of Athor, by a dynamical process uh, should have been implanted uh, in its current location in the inner uh, main belt. However, what we try to do with our present study that we, 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 we show today is which was the dynamical mechanism that uh, managed to implant it inside the belt and when did this happen? So we did, uh, we combine this meteoritic data ground-based uh, observations of small bodies. We did further, uh, we expanded the thermal uh, modeling of the parent body of uh, the EL chondrites. And then we performed a series of dynamical simulations in order to study different scenario of how this object can come from the terrestrial planet region inside uh, the belt. So what we found, we concluded that the parent body of uh, the ensatite uh, meteorites was implanted um, in the asteroid uh, belt uh, during um, uh, the orbital instability of the giant planets. So colleagues of our uh, work uh, from, uh, from Boulder, they had another recent study that they put the upper limit of, uh, of uh, the giant planet instability that was first proposed in the NIST model 20 years ago in the same institute now that we did the study 20 years after. Uh, so, uh, so these colleagues propose, uh, propose that you cannot have an instability later than 100 million years after the formation of the solar system. I remind here that the NIST model said the instability probably happened around 600, 700 million years um, after that, and it was responsible for the late heavy bombardment of small bodies on the moon. So. Now we have the upper limit from, from, uh, from our colleagues and our study shows that uh, the lower limit, uh, the earlier time that instability uh, should have happened is uh, around 60 million years. And uh, uh, we set this time because the parent body of the EL chondrites should, could not have its fast breakup here earlier than this time, otherwise we wouldn't have seen the ensatite meteorites as we see them today. It needed at least, at least 60 million years, this initial body, to cool off after its accretion in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the terrestrial region. So you form the body, you have to wait 60 million years, then you can break it, and then a fragment is implanted by the giant planet instability in this window. So what we did then, to, in summary with the study, is that we timed now more precisely the, the instability to happen in this window. We have several other corroborating evidence uh, for, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, window and our work excludes uh, an area of instability. There are some other studies that they propose instability have happened about 10 million years, so much, much earlier. Uh, uh, however, our work excludes that by using a lot of observational and meteoritic data. And another thing is that the major event that happened in the terrestrial planet region at this time window, it was the formation of our moon. So we had 
a, a fifth object at that time that we call it Thea, and this at some point impacted uh, our planet, giving it almost its final mass, and then uh, generated, uh, creating the, the, the our only uh, natural uh, satellite. So there have been some other studies in the recent years that they showed that this can happen. So the giant planet instability could trigger the moon forming event about 10, 20, or even 30 million years after its occurrence. So, and we have data from the samples from the moon that they say the moon should have formed, you know, in this window. And now we see that, that with our study, we coincide very well. So, thank you. Um, we will now uh, move to our per second presentation with Scott Bolton. Please give us a couple of minutes to get the slides up. Thank you for your patience. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some results from Juno. Juno is currently in orbit uh, around Jupiter right now. It goes in a polar orbit, and this is one of the images that we get. Um, and there you see the familiar great red spot, um, just a piece of, a, of the picture. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're what's called our extended mission. So here's a, a plot that shows our orbits. And so you're looking sideways. Jupiter's the big object in the we're the right side there, and um, the gray orbits uh, are all prime mission, and, and what's happening is Jupiter is twisting the orbit, what's called the line of apsides around, and so the perijove, or the part that goes close to Jupiter, starts moving north, about one degree per orbit, and then, um, and then eventually we cross where the way the, I'd say this pointer uh, works here, um, the orbit moves this way, goes over the pole and then out the south over the North Pole. And so uh, that's how we flew by the satellites um, is this orbit was evolving. And so I'm going to show some some results from uh, a recent flybys of Io, uh, which is the most volcanic body in the solar system. And um, and I'll also show some atmospheric stuff on Jupiter, which comes from the fact that we're getting very, very close to the North Polar region. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to show is a is a photo. Uh, we we have a camera on board. It's called Juno Cam, and we take all that data and it goes to, onto a website and actually public uh, people make the picture. So all these pictures are made uh, by the public. This one in particular is actually made by one of the scientists on Juno, but most of them are all posted, and anybody that's listening or any of the readers of your news articles can go onto our website missionjuno.com and actually get access to the pictures, the raw data, or you can just Photoshop somebody else's picture. And when you make the picture, you are the photographer, so you actually have the copyright even, and you can assign that copyright. The only thing we ask is if we post it on the website um, that NASA and scientists are allowed to use that image for science, but otherwise uh, it's yours to do what you wish with. So this is a pretty fascinating picture because it's showing Io. Io is very close uh, to Jupiter. It's orbiting at about five um, radial distances of Jupiter away, so it's actually pretty close. Jupiter is massive. It's huge, three over 300 times the mass of Earth, and so it's squeezing this, uh, this small moon, which is a little bit bigger than our moon, about 1,800 uh, kilometers in radius, and what you see is, a, is, is mountains, so it's actually got a mountain building going on. You look along the Terminator here, and you can see uh, the shadows, and I'm going to show some stuff on that. And then you see the colors here. These are a little bit stretched, but they're real, and that you see these reds and yellows and a little bit of green, and that's because this body is, the, is actively spewing out volcanoes, and that's going to be part of the story today. And those, you know, the sulfur, like if you were to go to a volcanic place on the Earth, it smells pretty bad, and it also looks quite colorful. Uh, Io's no different. It's, uh, in fact, other than the Earth, it's the only place that we see active magma volcanoes going on in our solar system. We haven't seen another. We see things that are left over, but they're not active. Io is actually doing it all the time. Okay, so another picture is something I want to point out is we see this mountain right here, and it was very intriguing to get this because this, this dark part is the shadow. The sun is coming in from the right side, and you can see over here it has a very sharp peak. And that was very intriguing as to what could make that shadow. And so um, I like mountain climbing and, and skiing and snowboarding. And when I see something like that, I'm very intrigued about what it would be like to go there. Um, also, 
I should mention that Io is very cold because it's in the outer part of the solar system. So the surface of it is probably minus 100 degrees Celsius or something in that neighborhood. Whereas the magma, of course, is might be 1,000 degrees coming out. But it's, when it comes out and a volcano goes off, it immediately freezes and probably makes sulfur snows and things like that. It's not quite like our uh, the stuff that we ski on. But it's got it's its own version of the Alps, so to speak. And so what we did was we um, used a little artistic license in order to make a little movie of what it would be like if you could go visit Io yourself. And I do want to go there. Um, now that I saw this movie, I'm ready to go snowboard. Um, so here it is. And what we did was we used the scientific data to understand the shadows and measure the distance. It may not be perfectly right, but this is sort of what it would be like if you went there. We call this Steeple Mountain uh, because of, it's so steep there at the edge. It's literally um, maybe Io's version of the Matterhorn. Um, so I, rec I think uh, this should be one of our ski and snowboard destinations. So just so you get an idea how many volcanoes are going on. So this, these are two visible light images that have been mixed with an infrared image. Um, the infrared in image is, is uh, an instrument called Juram, which is made uh, in Italy. It was contributed by the Italian Space Agency. And JunoCam is our visible light image. And we just pasted on the hot volcanoes, all of those glowing things. And so this is not just one place that has just a couple of volcanoes on it. Um, it's popping all over the place. And what's happening is it's so close to Jupiter, it's being tortured with what's called tidal forces. So Jupiter's gravity is pulling on it so much that the insides are literally getting squeezed and the magma is getting created and then just pops out all over the place. Um, so another picture, this is an infrared picture that's pretty recent. And you can see this one feature here is a lava lake that's called Loki, but you can see it's covered with, uh, with lava um, and volcanoes going off all the time. So if you were hiking around there, there'd be a lot of spectacular stuff. So this is a close-up of one of those lakes, also the same lake, that Loki Lake right here, and it's very reflective, what's called specular reflection. So the material on the top of that, in order to be that reflective, must be a little bit like obsidian glass, which is also formed near volcanoes on the Earth. I'm not saying it's obsidian, but whatever it is, it's very smooth. And it's smooth to the wavelengths of light, which means it's pretty smooth. Um, and so that this is a, a lake, basically, of lava that's going around here. It's probably cooled off with a crust. And there's some edges that we can see in the infrared where it's glowing. And then this is an island in there. And uh, while Loki Lake and Loki Crater has a name, there's no real name for that island. So uh, the team we're just calling that at the moment um, Angio's Island, because it looks a little bit like an A. And also Angioletta Cordini helped build the germ instrument, which is helping us discover this. So we have a little movie of that lake if you were to go by as well. And I'll play that. Um, so here you start with the image from the top and you can see it's sort of like an A, but not exactly that island. And this is not, uh, but now you can start to see the rim, just like volcanoes here on the earth, um, the lakes are uh, filled with maybe a colder crust, and then there's some hot lava coming out on the edges. So that's another place to go hike. I wouldn't necessarily say go skiing, but the top of that island is probably very cold, whereas the lake of lava is probably very hot, or certainly underneath it. Um, okay, so we also have an instrument on board our uh, Juno that's called the microwave radiometer, and it looks in microwave eyes. So we don't, we can't see ourselves that way, but it's basically a radiometer. So it's measuring heat, and this is at one one of the frequencies. We have six frequencies, so this is looking sort of at the top end of of IO. And if you had microwave eyes, this is what you would see. The red means warmer. And uh, yellow means a little bit cooler, and blue means colder. And so this is the North Pole. And so what you see is this Io is colder at the pole, and the middle around it is uh, is warm. And that's not a lot different than the Earth, of course. We have that, and it's probably partly due to the fact that the sunlight's shining more on the on the equator area than the poles. But it may also be that there's something internal in the processes, and so we're at the beginning of understanding all of this data, but we may be able to say something about how the interior processes work by being able to study this kind of uh, data. So just to show you a picture of all three in three different wavelengths, 
you have the microwave on the side, if you had microwave eyes, the visible light, and then the infrared light. So these are really tools of science. And when you can look at things in different wavelengths, you can compare them and you can learn a lot. Give you another example of this. Here's what it, uh, oh wait, I wanted to show one last thing. This was a picture uh, just taken a couple of days ago. Um, we flew by Io at about a distance of uh, maybe 10 or 15,000 kilometers away. And uh, this picture just came down and was processed. I first saw it yes, last night, so I threw it in this really quick. And you, you're now looking at the south, uh, southern hemisphere and the south pole in this picture, um, which normally we, we have never seen before. So we have infrared versions of this as well. So we're going to start to map out the, uh, the uh, volcanoes on the, on the south now. So it's very exciting. Um, but here's an example of Jupiter's atmosphere in this three same three wavelengths. So over here is the microwave eyes, over here is visible, and over here is infrared. Now, when you look at the poles of Jupiter, um, they're covered in what we call circumpolar cyclones. Nobody really knew that until Juno got up over the pole and we looked down and there were these giant cyclones, po polar vortices. And um, we first saw them my memory to the first of is, is we looked at them in the infrared and the visible, and we didn't know what these were and how they were constructed. We've been monitoring them in the infrared throughout the mission, and they're pretty stable and they don't change that much. But when you, and we're just getting to the point where we're over the poles close enough that the microwave can actually resolve them. And so this is one of the first images of that. And what you're seeing is deeper down with this, here you're looking at the top of the, of the reflective part of the clouds, and here you're looking at heat, right? And so you can see these different cyclones look different. There's actually eight of them uh, around uh, the center one, which is right at the pole. And while these look similar, they're warmer here, uh, and there's some that are a little bit colder. When you look over here, uh, they look very different, even though they look uh, a little bit similar in the infrared. When I go to look in the, in the visible light, I can see there's differences in the polar one in particular and some of the other ones. When I go over to the microwave, now I'm looking deeper into the clouds, underneath the clouds, there's almost no signature. In fact, the, the, uh, the top one right at the pole is actually looks colder. That means that it may have more ammonia in it and because we're not seeing very deep. Jupiter gets warm as we go down. The microwave uh, can see deep, but ammonia blocks us, and so you see something cold. Here you see warm things, which means maybe there's less ammonia, and I'm seeing down. And what you see is, is that sometimes something um, looking very different in the infrared or the visible, and they look very different than they do here. For instance, look at these two right here. They look very different in the microwave, but yet in visible light, they look almost identical. And the same thing over here in the infrared. They look almost identical, and yet there's something going on underneath the clouds that's very different. Um, the center one might be upwelling, actually, you know, and the other ones may be funnel clouds going down. Um, so I'm going to switch, and I'm going to touch on a subject that's a little bit similar to what the first speaker talked about, which is the formation and evolution of Jupiter. We um, that was one of our primary goals. This is an artist sketch of a of looking down uh, at the at the early solar system. So you have the proto uh, the early sun forming right here. Um, something happened. I ran out of battery for I can't point. But the big white spot is um, sort of an early sun, and then you're watching the the dust and uh, proto solar proto planetary nebula. Um, coming out and the first planet may be forming out there, and that presumably was Jupiter. And so one of the things that we were set out to do was to understand the composition of Jupiter and whether uh, whether there was a core so we could understand how things were formed. So we were following a mission that went in 1995 that launched literally a Galileo probe, was part of the Galileo mission, and it fell into the atmosphere, dropped by parachute. This is a picture of the actual probe, which looks like something out of a science fiction film, so I really love this. And it measured the composition. And what we found was that Jupiter is very similar to the sun, mostly hydrogen and helium, but it was enriched in what cosmologists call heavy elements. So that's everything heavier than helium. And it had about three to four times compared to hydrogen of what the sun had. And the question was, how did that happen? 
And so here was the data that they got from Galileo. And so you see on the bottom our composition of some noble gases, argon, krypton, xenon, and then carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen. And the, where the green turns to gray would be exactly the same as the sun, uh, a ratio of one to the sun. And you can see almost all of them are at about three to four, which shows that they're enriched. And the question is, how's that enriched? How did Jupiter get enriched? It's important to us because the stuff that Jupiter's got more of than the sun is what we are made out of. So it's, it ties right to us. The puzzle was the things that are in yellow, the Galileo probe measured very low oxygen abundance, which is in the form of water in Jupiter. And it was so low, it really puzzled scientists because at that moment, people thought, some, most scientists believed that the only way you could enrich Jupiter was water ice must have gone in. So how could the enrichment happen and the water ice be low? So it was a big puzzle. And so we showed that there were three different categories maybe that could affect different ways that you form Jupiter. And so one of our goals was to measure the water. And you can see the blue is where we measured it. And that basically shows that water in, in the uh, equatorial region of Jupiter is about the same enrichment as the other heavy elements. And so this is the real, the first direct evidence um, of what went on with the Galileo probe. A lot of people theorized, in fact, somebody in the audience was one of those people theorizing that the reason the Galileo probe measured small amounts of water was it went into a hot region, the Sahara Desert of Jupiter, and it was just dry. And, um, and that was a good theory. This data shows us that the average equatorial region is actually enriched and that Galileo probe did actually go into a very rarefied region. Uh, maybe it was unlucky or maybe we were lucky that we got to see a unique spot. Um, this is still a puzzle because it doesn't answer exactly how Jupiter formed because we also are looking at the core. And in theory, um, the core of heavy elements should have an enrichment that's similar to the top if it's well mixed and it doesn't match that. Our gravity field data looks at the mass distribution of Jupiter and it's implying that there's very low amounts of oxygen and heavy elements. And that's a puzzle because it implies that Jupiter is not mixed from top to bottom. Um, sounds like something that could make sense, but uh, most scientists did not believe that. So Jupiter, Juno is results are sort of turning a lot of these theories on their head and we're still sort of figuring it out. And we have to mix this kind of data with the meteorite data that you heard about earlier. And maybe we'll finally figure out how our solar system was made and how other solar systems are made that we're now discovering. So thank you. Much. Um, so we have now some time for uh, question and answers. Just uh, to remind everybody who is online, there are two ways that you can ask questions of our presenters. Um, you can either um, raise your hand uh, on the um, in the Zoom room, which I will be able to see here and then call on you, or you can type your questions into the chat and we, I will ask them on the journalist's behalf. Uh, if you have questions in the room, please just raise your hand and I will uh, call on you. So I will actually start with a question that I have uh, from online already, which uh, there are two questions for uh, Chrissa from uh, Javier, and again, I apologize if I mispronounce your, your name, but uh, from Javier Barbazano. Uh, so the question that they have is firstly, uh, if the giant planet migration didn't cause the late heavy bombardment, what did? To my understanding, I think what the meteorite says that they studied the uh, material from the moon and so on is like it didn't happen exactly like that. We didn't have the late heavy bombardment. So it's not that there is another process, it's just the general idea of the late heavy bombardment is waning as it was initially described. Lovely. And yeah. the second question that they also have is, how do you link the planet migration with the Thea impact just by the timing? And I, again, maybe mispronouncing Thea, that is T-H-E-I-A. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's correct. It's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so as I showed before, probably the very last slide, um, there were a couple of uh, two or three works, actually recent works, that the dynamical, pure dynamical studies that they showed that uh, if we enact the giant planet instability at some time in the history of the solar system, after 10 to 30 uh, million years, uh, the the giant impact can happen on earth so we start from a five let's say uh 
uh, planets in the terrestrial region. So we have Proto Earth, Thea, and so on, and the other um, three. Um, and uh, so we have a small delay. Then we have uh, from other independent uh, uh, data for the moon and the Apollo missions, I think, that uh, the formation of the moon was between like 60 and 100 or 120 million years uh, after the formation of the solar system. So if you enact the instability at 60 million years, so in our window, still you can have the moon formation in the same time, even if you enact instability 100 million years with the upper limit by David Nesvorny and, and uh, colleagues, then you still can have the the younger age for the moon, which is like 120 or something like that, what it is in the literature. So we are still good. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, any additional questions, either online or in the room? Uh, yes, I'll bring the microphone to you. Thank you. Hey, I have a question for Scott, uh, but uh, first of all, uh, I really like that you uh, see the skiing and hiking in those uh, celestial uh, objects uh, because uh, sometimes I'm wondering the same about mountain biking, but uh, it's uh, uh, I usually don't share that because uh, people always look at me like, uh, why would you? And so it's great <laughs> that uh, uh, to, to find this uh, relation. But I, I was wondering about all the new uh, thermal data uh, and the volcanic activity. Uh, how that uh, links with the uh, with the thin atmosphere on uh, on the moon? Uh, if uh, the atmosphere can retain some of the, for instance, uh, the volcanic activity, uh, or if it's so thin that it it becomes irrelevant, and therefore it's more about uh, uh, looking directly into the the spots where the volcanoes are. Well, I, I mean, I think from the volcanic activity, there probably is a very thin atmosphere, you know, that's very uh, tenuous on on Io, um, but it's freezing out right away. And so it's not a substantial atmosphere, but those volcanoes are all over the place and they're going off constantly, right? And we can see changes uh, that are happening on Io, and we have for many years been able to see that. So I think there is a thin atmosphere that's there. Um, and one of the things that's happening you know, Io is getting tortured by Jupiter, right? By getting squeezed so much, but it's getting its revenge by the fact that all those volcanoes are going off and that atmosphere is getting stripped away by the magnetosphere. So what's happening is Jupiter's filled with charged particles, right? Uh, its magnetosphere is, and its magnetic field is whipping around every 10 hours. So Io is going around in like in a day and three quarters or something. So this magnetosphere overtakes it hits it and strips away whatever happens to be tenuous, right? Whatever's coming off. And it's basically filling Jupiter's magnetosphere with sulfur ions, oxygen ions, all the different material that's coming off of Io is basically dominating Jupiter's magnetosphere. So this little tiny moon has a huge effect. And you can even see um, light and relationships going on in Jupiter's atmosphere because Io is creating aurora because the magnetic field has got it is like an umbilical cord tying it to the big planet. And so these particles are going back and forth. And so um, even, it's so powerful that not only is it filling Jupiter's magnetosphere with it, these things are hitting the other moons even, right? I mean, it's by far the most dominating thing in that magnetosphere, other than the fact that Jupiter's rotating around at 10 hours. I don't know if I got to all of your question on the atmosphere, but and I, uh, I I will add mountain biking to this because I do that too. Solar system tourism starts here. Might maybe? as well. <laughs> uh, any additional questions, either in the room or online? Remember, you can raise your hand or type the question in the chat if you are online. Either of those will work. Just a couple of checks. Any extras in the room? Nope. Okay, I think that will bring us to a close then. So all that remains to say is uh, thank you very much to our speakers for participating in today's press conference. A recording of the press conference is has been made and will be made available on the EGU YouTube channel within the next few hours for anyone watching who wants to review some of that amazing um, footage or data that was presented here today. 
Uh, um, this is the fourth press conference out of seven that we are running this week at the EGU's General Assembly. Our next press conference will be this afternoon, uh, PC5, which is entitled Learning from the Ancients, Journeys, Giants and Calcium Buildup, and that will start at 3.30 CEST this afternoon. Um, if you need any additional assistance with your media inquiries, if you wish to speak to any of our panelists either today or at any other press conference, please visit the EGU's media.egu.eu website where you'll be able to find contact information and resources to help you. At that, all that remains to say is uh, to ask everybody in the room to join me in thanking our panelists for their excellent presentations. Thank you very much.